which reference you need. Um, <clears throat> so this is called economic change and ideas, as you know. But you're also quite aware, I imagine, all the staff changes that occurred in the last year, okay, which has caused rather a, a fracas in the, in the content of the courses. So uh, from my point of view, I know a lot of you want to do it. Who wanted to do economic modelling? Okay, right. Uh, and I was teaching global, globalisation and financialization last year also with Rex. Now I've moved here. Um, and I know that a lot of you wanted to come and do, learn a bit about non-equilibrium modelling. Now, I can't do the multi-agent stuff. If you want to harass anybody about multi-agent, this guy over here, Tim Gooding, a PhD student, just finished his PhD on multi-agent modelling and net logo. But we don't have anybody like Antoine who is teaching it now anymore. So I'm going to include what I did in the modelling component of, that, of the, the modelling course here, which is pretty much teaching you the basics of complex systems, non-linearity, and using how to use my Minsky software. Uh, who did not want to do modelling? Right, well, that's why I said I'll make the, I think the assessment optional. So I suggest attending the lectures on that, um, but don't... I won't, if I set an assessment which involves the modelling, there'll be an either-or without any modelling whatsoever for those who just don't want to do it. So that may go a bit over people's heads. Uh, it may be a bit weird, but it's part of how I want to teach you about how to, to think about the economy in general. So I'm going to have... This is, this is very much a rough outline because I'm putting this together from two, actually probably three separate courses for this year. So what I'll be talking first of all is the concept of value theory. Have you done some value theory with, with Rex, I imagine? Marx's theory of value or that sort of thing? Okay. Uh, and the role of energy in thermodynamics, which is a particular hobby horse of mine. Uh, then looking at what I see as a foundation for being able to do complex systems economics, which is forget the neoclassical framework, uh, but you can find it, and forget the stock standard labour theory of value of Marx as well, but you can find a, a foundation for a complex systems view of the world in Marx's dialectical philosophy. Who's read any of Marx here, by the way? I heard a bit of discussion going on beforehand. One, any others? Okay. Uh, I take a very non-standard reading of Marx, so a fair bit of the next, not this lecture, but the next lecture is going to be on my interpretation of Marx as well. Then the whole re the reality of instability in capitalism. You know the neoclassical perspective is everything in equilibrium. Well, I'm sorry, that's um, completely asked about tip, in my opinion, on the nature of capitalism. So I'll be talking a bit about instability in general and why most dynamic systems are out of, out of equilibrium. The whole idea of a dynamic system being in equilibrium is virtually nonsense. But also some of the precursors in the literature are talking about uh, instability, Schumpeter, Fischer and Minsky in particular, but then also a fair bit of work from a guy called Richard Goodwin, who I don't know whether many would have heard of, but he was the uh, a leading exponent of nonlinear dynamics and economics. Then my approach to monetary economics, you know, you're aware of the endogenous money school of thought. I realised last year that was a useless acronym, or a useless title, for anybody who didn't know what the hell you were talking about in the first place. And this one occurred to me, it said, Bank Originated Money and Debt, with a nice acronym of BOMBED. So I want to make that the, act, the, the, the way people think about what, what I, we used to call endogenous money. And using, I'll be modelling that in Minsky as well, but that'll be using Minsky as a tool rather than expecting you to understand the, the mathematical logic behind it. Then complexity, you know, this is where I'm starting to get into the modelling component of the course, so the whole issue of what is complexity and how can you get a different foundation for macroeconomics than what the neoclassicals have, because their hang-up is always derived mac macro from micro. You're all familiar with that? Okay. What, a, what, in some ways, what a complex system approach does is <coughs> say, let's build the structure, the, the core structure of a system, and the structure itself will give you most of the dynamics, even with very simple relationships between it. So I'll show you that as an approach to building models and finally showing how to model in Minsky. So anybody downloaded a copy of Minsky yet? Okay, a couple. Of, have you downloaded the latest version? No, I need to. Okay, because I'll just actually, this, this is the link for downloading it. Anyway, okay. And um, so you just click on there. If, you, if you've got a Windows PC, just click on the download link there. If you have Mac or if you're a Linux user, uh, click on files here and you'll find a link to different types of files. Okay, there's also a beta build. I wouldn't recommend the beta right now because what we're doing at the moment is changing the tables that I use to do double entry bookkeeping in Minsky where 
revising them to be strictly compatible with double entry bookkeeping and getting rid of the what I regard as fairly crappy third party uh, tool we're using for, for spreadsheets and putting a new one in there, but it's very much at the beginning area. So don't don't touch the beta, just stick with the latest version. And just to give you a warning about it, when you download it, it we won't work on my machine right now because um, I've already installed the software. But if you choose download, um, first we get asked whether you want to keep the file. You know, this, this is the Windows being um, the nanny state of Microsoft. Do you want to keep it? Then you, when you answer yes to that, store it on your computer. Then when you click run, it'll say, Windows has prevented this file making changes to your system. We'll not run it. There's a little link called more info. Click on more info and you get a choice run anyway, and then you can install it. The reason being it hasn't been registered with Microsoft, that's all. Okay? So only software that they've got registered actually gets past that particular barrier. But take, have that installed and have a bit of a play with it before, um, before we actually get to that point. Now, I don't have any textbook. Um, I'm rather critical of textbooks. Uh, useful references, I'll just see who any, has anybody got a copy of this one yet, Debunking Economics? Okay. And um, also, can we avoid another financial crisis? Which is a lot. Anybody got a copy of that? Okay. I'm happy to give PDFs of that one. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not requiring a set of textbook, but that will give you a good overview of my approach to monetary modelling. Um, and there's one other book which I highly recommend for those who want to get a. I, I regard this as the best, the best uh, textbook from a non-neoclassical point of view in economics ever. Uh, but it's been out of print, and so if you just click on that link, you might find something useful about it on that link. Okay? Yeah. So you would recommend that over like Chiarella? Sort of uh, which one over Chiarella? Yeah. Well, I don't know. Well, I mean, if you've, you've got a copy of. Uh, a Chiarella and Flashell's book, have you? It's, they can be found. It's pretty heavy. <laughs> pardon, pardon? They can be found. Sorry. They can be found, yeah. Oh, oh, online, you mean? Okay. <laughs> well, Carl died a couple of years ago, so I'm, you know. But you would recommend starting with this? I'd recommend that because Carl wasn't the world's best writer. Okay? He, he was caught up in a bit of the Borbarchy tendency of talking about theorem and lemma and the maths is chucked in with the, with the text as well. Blatt was actually a professor of... Uh, of, of applied, oh, actually probably professor of mathematics period, but uh, at the University of New South Wales. He was actually an Austrian refugee from Hitler, uh, so he's very much an Austrian uh, personality. And um, famous, of, I'm trying to make this a bit famous, he was one of two people at the University of New South Wales who was nominated for a Nobel Prize. He didn't get it, he was nominated twice for the prize in physics in the 1950s. Um, and another guy called Murray Kemp was nominated for the prize in economics. It happened. Murray, by the way, is a lovely human being, except for one thing, he always beats me at tennis. But apart from that, he's a great guy. But he's a straight neoclassical in everything he does and very, very focused on international trade theory. And the, the story of how John Black got to write a book on economics was that John was famously rude. I never met him. I think you're possibly glad that I didn't because uh, he was very devastatingly critical of anybody to their face. Uh, but Murray regarded John as probably his only peer at the University of New South Wales because they'd both been nominated for a Nobel Prize. So Murray invited John to come along to a seminar, which was typical Murray paper was on uh, international trade theory. And after he finished, he asked John what he thought, and I can't do an Austrian accent to save my life, but I'll give it a try. He said, uh, that is the greatest lot of rubbish that I've heard since I've been at this university. If that is what you think is decent economics, I intend finding out what's wrong with economics. And then about two years later, he produced this book. And what he did, he actually went right back and read the entire literature and then tried to put the literature in mathematical format as well. And knowing he was dealing with a, a species that didn't have much knowledge of economics, i.e. economists, if they think they know economic mathematics, they've got nothing on physicists. Uh, so he wrote, the mathematics was normally stored in appendices to each chapter. So it actually can be read by somebody without mathematical background. So I highly recommend that book. So do click on that link and see what happens. So, that's enough of a preliminary. Uh, should I try to get to know <coughs> names, or do we do that over in the break, perhaps? Will you put these slides somewhere? Pardon? Yeah, they're going to go up on, on the on the canvas. Oh. <laughs> yeah. You've got a similar attitude to canvas to 
Uh, I did, I did, Kingston has a capacity to go from one dreadful system to another dreadful system. They've gone from the thing called study space none of us could stand to canvas that is even worse designed, in my opinion. Anyway, I'll put the slides up here after, after today's lecture. So, value theory. Why start there? Well, the, I take a, a fairly pragmatic perspective on the idea of theory of value. You have to know where stuff comes from. Okay? You have to know how we produce physical output. How do we produce more outputs than inputs? And that's something that economic theory in some ways began with, but then forgot the question of what value actually was. But the essence is producing more outputs than inputs. Okay? If we didn't have that, we'd be going backwards. <coughs> um, we, you know, we'd be going from, from here to the cave rather than versa, vice versa. And that's the topic that value theory is really about. How do you produce net output? And every school has got its own answer. And in fact, they've even redefined the question to suit the answer they want. So the neoclassical vision of what value is comes down to utility, fundamentally increasing utility. Same for the Austrian. Um, I think you, you, you're never going to have a resolution of that debate within economics itself. So I've taken a step back and said what we have to do has to be consistent with the laws of thermodynamics. The idea we have on value has to be consistent with what we know about the fundamental physics of the open system the Earth is. Because if we're not compatible with physics at the fundamental level, we're going to be wrong. Now, I'm not saying that means that you can reduce economics to applied physics. Has anybody heard of the name Georgescu Rosen? Okay, so Rogan was somebody who discovered the laws of economists who discovered the laws of thermodynamics in the 50s and 60s and in some ways tried to find how to apply those laws within economics. I think that went too far. That's a bit like trying to make physics into applied uh, chemics, chemistry into applied physics. But you can't have something which contradicts that fundamental understanding of the physical world either. And I want to uh, explain why that's the case. And looking at those the theories we have currently of production from all schools of thought, they're either wrong, incompatible with what we know about thermodynamics, or they're tangential. And in that sense, I see the post-Keynesian approach as tangential because it's easy to add a couple of extra conditions to make it consistent, whereas the neoclassical, the Austrian, the Marxian are all frankly wrong, simply wrong from the point of view of thermodynamics. And the only school of thought that I think actually came close to being correct was, in fact, the very first since formally recognised school of thought called the physiocrats. Has anybody read anything by the physiocrats at all? Okay, have you heard of Canet, Francois Canet? An early physiocrat can be seen as being Cantillon. There's also Turgot, but mainly a French school. Cantillon was actually an Irishman who worked in France, uh, which actually happened centuries ago. But I think they were the only ones which were close to being correct about it. And so looking now at the, the different definitions we, we start from, neoclassical theory and Austrian theory both see subjective utility as the basis of value. And this is what the, the mainstream, if you ask the mainstream economist what is value, well, they say it's utility. Okay? Increasing utility is the object of human society. And I think in many ways it was best put by one of the very, very early precursors of neoclassical thought, Jean-Baptiste Say. And I presume you've all heard of Say's Law. Okay, well, this is the culprit behind the concept. And he was writing back at the same time as Adam, actually, as, as David Ricardo, uh, well after Adam Smith. But his perspective was that if you give something that has no value, you give it utility, that's what creating value is. So creating value, from his point of view, is adding utility to something. If you ask a neoclassical economist what goes on in production, they talk about capital and labour being combined to produce outputs, but they'd also talk about the outputs having a higher utility than the input. That's a large part of the thinking. Uh, the post-Keynesian school, which I'm obviously largely associated with, has an agnosticism about the whole issue of value, because if you look back at the 19th century, you can see what were called in some ways the value wars, the methadone strike, if I can mispronounce that word as well, um, clashes between what were the end tail of Marxian and, and classical school economists with neoclassicals, um, which were just in, in some ways fruitless. So Marx came out with his supposed solution to the transformation problem. You then had Bombard work taking that on and criticising it. You had 
you know, masses and masses of angst and no resolution. And in some ways, the post-Keynesian school, because it is quite pragmatic about how it approaches economics, it says, look, output producers produced. Let's just take that as a given. Let's not even talk about the theory of value. Now, if you look at the classical school, starting with Adam Smith, the definition of they had a value was actually objective. If you read, who's, who's read Smith here? Okay, a few, okay. And Ricardo as well. And you'll see, particularly in Ricardo, he starts off by saying value is objective. Value reflects effort. Value is not utility. So strongly rejecting what we now see as the dominant neoclassical approach of saying it's all about subjective utility. Now saying it's objective, it involves the effort and labour is seen as the dominant but not the only form of effort there. And if you look in, in um, Smith, what he's basically saying is the increase in value comes from specialisation of labour. Those sorts of notions. Now Marx, I divide Marx into two time periods. So um, has anybody read anything more than Volume 1 of Capital? What have you read? I've uh, read some, Volume 2, Volume 3, and Grundrisse. Good. How far did you get the Grundrisse? All the way through, or...? No, I kind of jumped here and there because it's, it's not, like, very structured. You know what it actually was. It's his notes, isn't it? Just That's right. He was sitting in the British Library, writing, <coughs> going back and rereading all the classical theories mm -hmm. and annotating, writing just copious notes, and he's impossible to read handwriting. Um, as he was preparing to be to write what became capital. So it's literally as if your notes for this course were discovered by somebody a century later and put into book form. So the structure is crazy. But I've, well, maybe not your notes, but anyway. Um, but um, I've, I've read the whole lot. Uh, and I, I date, in fact, I date the page. If you're reading the Penguin version on page 256 and 257, I think it is, uh, you'll find what I see is a major shift in his thinking. But before this point that came along, he saw value as being embodied labour. So the amount of labour that was put into something, the number of hours of labour time, usually involves the work of the labour and converting machinery input to labour value equivalent, that was what he saw as value. And I'm putting in exploitation and in inverted commas because Marx did not just see capitalists as exploiting labour, he saw them as, being, as paying their full value. But the system generated exploit. The surplus came from labour, in that sense. That the source of surplus, they're being fairly paid under the rules of capitalism, but those rules of capitalism mean that they are effectively the source of all values. So they, get, they get less than what they put in. So that's looking at it from an economic point of view. And I want to dive completely into a different area of thermodynamics. Does anybody know what I'm talking about when I mention the laws of thermodynamics? Who doesn't know? Okay. That's, that's the perspective I'm taking overall. It's really the physics of the use and the transformation of energy. And again, we don't have anywhere near enough knowledge of this area in the social sciences. Um, but what they are, uh, they are laws in the genuine sense. You've all heard of the law of one price? Okay. Okay. It doesn't apply. Okay. It's broken every damn country you look at. The McDonald's hamburger costs different amounts of money in different countries. There's no way in which that so-called law is obeyed. Traffic laws, okay? What's the normal speed of traffic? The speed of the traffic, the, the, the legal limit plus five four miles an hour. Um, these are laws you simply cannot break. And there's a beautiful statement of why any theory that violates them, wherever that theory might apply, is going to be wrong, coming from a physicist who was a, a bit like a, who's a popular physicist these days, DeGrasse Tyson, that sort of person, somebody similar sort of person back in the 1920s and 30s. And in writing a popular book for people on physics, he said that the law that entropy increases has the supreme position amongst the laws of nature. He puts it beautifully. He says, if you have a, a pet theory that disagrees with Maxwell's equations, well, that's Maxwell's problem. And in fact, that's what Einstein did in a sense when he, well, no, not Einstein, but Planck when he developed the mathematical solution to what's called the black body radiation problem. It disagreed with Maxwell's equations, and it was so much the worse for Maxwell. That's where quantum mechanics came from. He said, if it's contradicted by observation, well, maybe the, the experiment has got something wrong. He said, if your pet theory is against the second law of thermodynamics, there's nothing for you to do but to collapse in deepest humiliation. Okay? Anything that contradicts that but relies upon physics at the same time is going to be wrong. 
And of course, we're producing stuff, we're necessarily relying upon physics, okay? in the sense that if we're going to be using, trying to produce physical output, we are in the physical world. For the obvious word, I'm using physics even just to describe output itself. So all the existing laws of economic, theories of economics violate this law by not being aware of it in the first place. And what we have to have, we have to start from a law which is accurate by it. And economic activity involves work. Again, these are terms we use all the time. We talk about physical output, physics. We talk about work. This is also, the, this is the physics of work, which is a case of taking energy and using energy to convert something from a less useful form into a more useful form. So in that sense, I'm still saying there's an increase in utility through production, but you're coming down physically to the laws of physics about how do you turn energy into something useful. Now, these laws were derived by experiment, by observation, and finally a set of mathematical principles behind them, which I'm not going to try to cover because two reasons. One, you don't need them to that detail, and two, I don't know them well enough myself yet to be able to recite them in lectures. But <clears throat> as they were developing, of course, economic theory had been through its major conflicts by this stage. If you can date economic theory from Adam Smith, and I actually date it from Cantillon, but if you start from 1776, that's almost a century before the laws of thermodynamics are properly formed. So most of economic debate occurred outside any knowledge of these laws of physics. So what you get is that most economics doesn't even relate to this discipline, and we haven't, re, we haven't properly incorporated it since then. So what you have is economists producing models of production that <coughs> violate these laws without even knowing they're doing it. And I'll give my favourite example of this. I was asked to speak at the United Nations Environment uh, Program confer a conference in um, Bangkok about five or six years ago, and I was there with a, a fellow worker in this area, and the chief, the, the chief economist for the INAP was there, and we're talking about the essential role of energy in production and how it's not included in economic theory, and he said, oh, if we don't have enough energy, we can make some more just by combining labour and capital. So we both looked at him and said, so you believe in perpetual motion machines then, do you? And he went, what? I said, the only way you could make energy is if you invent a perpetual motion machine. I want to explain what, what's behind that as, as I go through here. But fundamentally, economics is pretending we can produce stuff without using energy. Okay? And you can't do anything without energy. You can't attend this lecture without energy. Okay? Everything requires energy, and we can't produce it. This, this is what the laws are about. But if you look what economists do, you'll see things like the circular flow diagram. Now, when you look at those diagrams, which I'm sure you've seen in plenty of textbooks, they isolate the economy from the environment. And here's a few samples. This is from ManQ, I think. So what you have here is, you can't, can you see the text on that? Okay. Payments to for firms for goods and services, product markers, blue jeans, haircuts, apartments, goods and services flowing this way, uh, payments to households flowing this way. It's all nicely self-contained, and that's the mistake. If you have a closed system, and that's implying the economy is a closed system, it can produce nothing. Okay. Here's another one. Now, this has got the government. I don't Did Mancus have the government inside there? Look at that. He left the government out. Oh, dear, what a mistake. Okay. This one's got the government inside there and taxes and financial institutions and so on, but everything's self-contained. No output from out, and no, and no input from outside the economy is shown as being in that diagram. Now, you can't produce anything without outputs from outside the economy. All these, in, instead of saying you can produce stuff just within the economy itself. So you could leave nature out, and you could produce stuff in a vacuum, you could produce without sunlight, um, and everything's consumed inside the economy. And notice there's no waste. Wouldn't that be nice? Okay? The mindset we're put into is leaving out the link with the environment, which is essential both in terms of producing output and then having to dump the waste back into uh, the ecology over time. So what we've got is the closed system producing increasing output over time, which is impossible, according to laws of thermodynamics, as I'll explain in the rest of the lecture, and producing without waste, which is also impossible. 
So that's that's the mindset we've been locked into without actually realizing we're locked into a false mindset. Now, the only reason we actually have what we call the circular flow is because we're exploiting energy that already exists. The sun is the obvious long-term source, immediate source for energy on the planet, and we didn't make the sun. It happened to be there. Okay. So what I'm talking about by saying energy, energy we find freely available in the environment, it's stuff which existed before humanity. Okay. We didn't make it. We're mining it effectively. So we exploit solar energy, whether we're talking about directly exploiting it or we have fossil fuels or nuclear energy, where we're therefore ex exploiting what came out of a supernova a few billion years ago. So we can't produce energy. That's the, the first important point. Okay. That's in fundamentally the first law of thermodynamics. And we can only exploit the energy that currently exists. Okay, Because we can't make it, we can only use what's there. Now, when we exploit it, and including converting matter into energy through nuclear power, um, we necessarily generate waste in doing that. Oh, by the way, when we use energy, we don't destroy it. We change its form. Okay? That's another one. That's the conservation of matter and energy is the first, the first law. Now, when we use that energy to do work, to actually produce an output you want, you necessarily generate waste. It simply cannot... You cannot eliminate waste. Again, a lot of neoclassicals seem to believe if we get everything perfectly efficient, you know, we can eliminate all waste by in, you know, ex internalising all externalities, etc., etc. Zero waste. That's simply impossible. And those have come out of the second or the third laws of thermodynamics. So you've got to add quite a bit to that basic diagram to get anything which is even vaguely realistic about describing production on the planet. First of all, there have to be energy inputs from the map from the environment, not stuff we can make. We don't make coal. We can actually manufacture it if we like, but if we do, it takes more energy to manufacture than we get out of the stuff we've made. Okay, you cannot make a net energy gain. And we have to inject waste back into the environment. We have no choice. If we're going to exploit any of the energy, we have to dump waste back into the environment, period. You can minimise how much you dump back there, but you can't eliminate the dumping of waste. But something like this will be necessary. You've got the sun and you know, nuclear power energy as well, which then generates useful work, which is what then turns this thing, but generates waste as well, which goes back into the environment. That's that's probably the minimal notion. Has anybody got a, a red Kate Raworth's donut economics? Can't you... I've, I haven't finished reading it. What do you think of it? Halfway. Uh, I'm listening to it. Okay. Like it? Yeah, it's kind of preaching to the Pardon? converted. It's preaching to the converted with me, but it's yeah. good. Yeah. Yeah, I've enjoyed what I've read so far, but I haven't had a chance to finish it yet. She talks about the donut economy. I'm trying to persuade her. She's a good friend. I'm trying to persuade her. Maybe not, I haven't said I've finished reading a book yet, but anyway. Um, um, she calls it the donut economy, which is a very nice analogy. I'm trying to say it should be the wheel economy. Okay, because for a start, for donut conjures up images of Homer Simpson, which isn't all that healthy. Uh, and there's other people talking about the wheel economy, the circular economy, but the circle doesn't turn unless it's pushed. Whereas a wheel will turn if you push it with external energy. So I'm trying to push them to say we should have the wheel as our analogy rather than the circular flow or the circular economy. <clears throat> so why can't we produce without using already existing energy? And why can't we produce without using race? Well, this is where those laws of thermodynamics come in. And they're empirically true. There's, as, as Eddington emphasised, if you have a theory which relies upon violating those laws, your theory is wrong. It's just that absolute. No, they don't, they don't even bother discussing it. And they were discovered in the late, early to late 19th century, which is after Marx had developed the labour theory of value, and it was as neoclassical started to develop as well. Now, neoclassicals are often accused of aping physics, physics envy, stuff like that. But what they knew of physics really was 20 years, at the very best, 20 years behind where they were in time. So when they were developing their theories in the 1870s, it was based on what they knew of physics 20 or 30 years earlier. And Phil Murawski calls that type of theory, he called it energetics. It was before they actually understood the concept of energy properly. Um, so they weren't ex influenced by this notion of thermodynamics. 
And they're complicated rules of mathematics to understand them properly. I'm still getting my head around the mathematics and I, I won't, won't be trying to put them to courses or, or books for quite some time. But I think the best way of understanding is, is a joke which actually comes from the author called Allen Ginsberg. You heard of Ginsberg? Okay. And he came up with this in the 1950s. He said, the first law of thermodynamics is you can't win. The second law is you can't break even. Now, if you were in a game where you couldn't win and you couldn't break even, what would you want to do? Leave the game? The third law is you can't leave the game. Okay. So let's elaborate what they actually mean. Um, the third, you can't win, you can only break even. That's the absolute limit. So the very best you can do is, is get back what you put in effectively. You can only break even if you can find a point in the universe whose temperature is absolute zero. There's no such point. Okay. So that's, that's the overall framework. Now, how the hell do you get a theory of production out of that? Well, to translate them, you can't create or destroy energy. You can change its form, which is what we do when we, when we do work. We take high-frequency energy effectively and turn it into lower-frequency energy. Um, so you change its form. The maximum amount of energy you can actually use to do work depends upon the temperature of the environment into which you dump the waste from using that energy. And only the background temperature is absolute zero can you use, can you exploit all the energy that exists in an energy source to do useful work. Now because there's no such point, you necessarily have to not use some of the available energy in the energy source you're trying to exploit. Okay. Those are the basic laws. And I'll ultimately bring it back to what does it mean about production towards the end of this lecture. So let's look and see why wasting is inevitable. Because you've got to turn effectively, and I get criticised by some physicists for this exposition, but I think it's, it covers the basics that you guys need to know. And if you're going to use energy to do work, there's got to be potential energy that you're able to exploit. For example, a waterfall. Now, somebody, I, I had a, a static picture and somebody actually sent me a GIF with a moving water wheel. So there's a water wheel. The water's falling over the wheel. It's turning the wheel. The wheel is turning some gears inside the building it's attached to, and that's the wheel doing work. So could you actually exploit that water wheel if the point it was falling to is exactly the same height as where it started? No can do. Okay, So you've got to have a gap. There's got to be a gap between where the water starts and where it ends for you to be able to exploit the available energy in that water. And the same thing applies in general. You've got to have a gap between the energy source where it's used and the energy sink where you dump the remnants after you've exploited the energy you can find in it. Now, that's necessary for the waterfall. It's got to have a height greater than zero, zero feet. And the same idea implies in general, you can only do work if the energy of your source is greater than the energy of the surroundings in which you're doing it. So I'm not quite certain what a temperature a car engine operates, but it's something like about 700 degrees Celsius, would be roughly that level? Mm. In that order? You mean the actual explosion? Actual inside the cylinder, it's when, it, when the gas expands, gets to about yeah, 700 degrees. High, Pardon? Yeah. I, one of these wouldn't work on Venus, because that's roughly the temperature of the surface of Venus. It's, you can only do work if you give it more heat in your source than when you're dumping it afterwards. And the basic idea comes from the idea of a heat, a heat engine. You can do work if the heat of the engine is greater than the heat area of where you're dumping the waste after you've got it to do work by moving a piston. So imagine having an engine operating at 500 degrees Celsius and the environment, say, 25 degrees Celsius, a warm, a warm London summer's day, there's a flow of heat from the engine to the environment. And you can put an engine in there and harness that flow of, flow of heat to get it to do work. Now, if you had an engine at 500 degrees Celsius and the environment was the temperature of the surface of or somewhere in Venus, there's no flow. Okay? Heat will not flow from one spot to another. So you need to have the flow of energy before you can actually harness that energy to do useful work. So it doesn't just depend how powerful your engine is, which you measure 
like the temperature of the engine operates in absolute Celsius to Celsius degrees or Kelvin degrees. That's only half the equation. The other half is what are you dumping it into? So if you have an engine operating here, where it's 25 degrees Celsius, that same engine in the, in the Arctic would have more available in energy to exploit. It might also freeze up, but that's the point. You've got to look both at the heat of the source and the heat of the sink where you're dumping the waste, and the bigger the gap, the more, mac more usable energy there is there. But because the environment itself has some heat already, you can't exploit all the available energy in the energy source. So the maximum amount you can get out of an energy source to do work, and that's what I'm looking at here, how do we do work to produce physical output, uh, has, to be, has to be a gap between the environment, you're, the, the engine you're getting, the, you're exploiting the energy using, and then where you dump the waste from it. So the coldest temperature we can find, we, well, the temp coldest temperature that can exist, is minus 273.15 degrees Celsius. That's absolute zero. That's zero on the Kelvin scale. And we know that the average law of the temperature of the, the universe is 2.73 degrees Kelvin. That's the measured background radiation level of the universe. Supposedly, the, well, the physicists tell us, rather, that's the heat left over from the Big Bang. So even if you're working in the vacuum of outer space, you are still going to be wasting 2.7 degrees, 3 degrees worth of energy. Now, what's Earth's average temperature? Well, it's pretty much 300 degrees Kelvin. Not quite. 16 degrees above Celsius is the average temperature of the planet. So for that reason, about 290 degrees of the, of the heat capacity of any energy source cannot be used on this planet. It's got to dump that waste into the environment we find ourselves in. So at least that much potential energy is wasted. Okay? In other words, waste is an essential part of production, not something you can get rid of. You don't want to maximise it, but there's a point below which you can't minimise it. And that, again, is a very different perspective to the way the neoclassicals think about this because they don't start with the laws of physics. So even if you have an ideal engine with no friction, no leakages, etc., etc., its maximum efficiency has to be less than 100%. That's the basic idea. Here's the heat of the source, the heat of the dump. That's the maximum work you can get out. And the efficiency of a perfect engine, if you now describe the work that you're going to be doing using a perfect engine, then it's going to be 1 minus the gap between the heat of the dump, where you're dumping the energy, which we can pretty much take on this planet by being 300 degrees Kelvin, and the heat of the source which might be, say, five or 600 degrees Kelvin or 700 degrees Kelvin. That's the maximum amount we can actually exploit. The rest, we actually use the full energy producing capacity of this energy source. If you take oxygen and hydrogen and get a flame to ignite them and get water out of it, the energy you get, some of it is obviously dumped back into the environment itself. So if you had, a, say, a car operating at 1,000 degrees Kelvin, and the temperature was 300 degrees, then the maximum efficiency you get out of an engine would be 70% of the available energy. Okay. And again, engineers learn this sort of stuff right from the very outset. An engineering course learns all this material because they've got to know this stuff when they're designing physical engines. So they know the idea of perfectly efficient energy engine is impossible. Yeah? 600 degrees. 600 degrees. So you're off by 100. Whereabouts with the... It's 900. Pardon me, I'll bloody hell I'd do it, didn't I? You know. It's pretty close. Okay, I'll fix it up later. Okay. Little errors like that happen all the time. But it lowers the efficiency, isn't it? Okay, okay. So you're wasting energy, even with an ideal car engine, and the actual wastage of course can be much higher because I'm not taking into account friction, etc. etc. that has to be there as well. Now the second law gets worse. That's why, in some ways, why um, Addington said it was the ultimate law of physics. Heat has to be exchanged with an external system to actually be used, otherwise you can't extract the energy in the first place. And a closed system will degrade to the uniform temperature of the system over time. Now, if you have a closed system and it's got a temperature, temperature differential initially, over time that will be equalised. It's like you, know, you pour milk into a cup of tea. Okay. Ultimately, the temperature will be equalised. You won't have one section always hotter than the rest. And power generation works because we do dump that waste back in. So here's a, a typical diagram in a physics textbook of a uh, 
of a steam engine power plant, and notice part of it over here has got a cooling tower. Okay? You see them around the... I'm sure you've seen them travelling around the UK. Now, this is what generates power, but if you didn't dump this into the <coughs> environment, it wouldn't generate any power at all. I want to illustrate why that is. It's quite obvious when you think about it, but it's something we don't actually learn as economists. So if this bit was completely isolated from the environment, if you tried to avoid dumping any heat from a power plant into the environment, what would happen? Well, it becomes a closed system. So over time, the temperature of the whole thing would become the same temperature and the turbine wouldn't turn. Okay. You can only make it turn if there's a gradient in temperature between the input and the output to the turbine. And that applies in general. The closed and an isolated system goes from a high level of order over time. And by high level of order, what I mean is there's very, very few ways you can rearrange the system to have that particular combination. So if you think about a Rubik's cube, okay, when you've got it in the final, all the colours, it's red, green, blue on each side and nothing else, that's, an, that's a unique combination for the Rubik's cube. But if you want to scramble it to get a large number of colours, on each side, there's thousands and thousands of ways you can do that. So the high order is when there's only a tiny number of ways to do it. And that's called low entropy, just to make it nice and confusing. And I get confused by it all the time. So high order is called low entropy. Largely saying it's a low probability that it could ever be in that state to begin with. Now, if you think about the products you have like your computers, that's, that's that a, is that an Alienware? Yeah. I've got one as well back at home. Particularly ugly machines, aren't they? Ugly in a sort of assertive type way. I don't think this one is. Well, we want to have 22 out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so that's... The, how, how ordered is that compared to the silica from which the chips were first made? It's far more ordered, isn't it? It's got low entropy. So in that fundamental sense, production, which we take for granted all the time... <coughs> is taking sources which are high, which are, have got some structure to them. We want to find an ore body with a large amount of cobalt in it, for example, which is an essential part of making batteries. You take stuff which has got... But, but it's, it's scrambled with all sorts of other stuff. Okay? We want to take it out and make it to a highly refined product which goes into your batteries. So we're going from disorder, which is high entropy, to order, which is low entropy. That's what production involves. Now, that's going in the opposite direction to what we know as the laws of the universe. I want to, how do you have to make, make that compatible? Well, this is a, I, I did this with PowerPoint, so it doesn't quite work all that well. But imagine you had a, a cylinder where you've got most of the air is, a, 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 where is pressured by a piston into one particular corner, and you then let the piston go. And what's going to happen over time is this sort of stuff. I'll bounce around and you'll finally have even pressure either side of the piston and the piston moves to the point where it equalises the pressure in the two halves of the cylinder. So that's going from a... If you go back again, that is, a, that is low entropy or high... Uh, that's, that's a very um, unlikely arrangement. You've got to use force to put the air in that arrangement. So it's less likely than this arrangement where there's dozens and dozens or thousands of ways you can get the same arrangement by moving those molecules around. So that's what happens over time. And that's high entropy, fairly uniform pressure. So the standard laws of, th of thermodynamics are you'll go from low entropy to high entropy over time. Disorder increases. <clears throat> and that's a universal tendency. That's the second law of thermodynamics. So this is a little cartoon of a child. Oh, actually, it can be me as an adult, given how messy I am, uh, using the second law of thermodynamics as an explanation of why the room is a mess. Okay? You can't fight the second law. Well, you can, but it takes energy to do it. So, how does this relate to economics? I'll go about 10 minutes on this, and then we can talk a bit, and, and uh, I'll get to know some names here. So, you can reduce waste, but you can't eliminate it. So, therefore, you've got an intimate link between economics and ecology. Now, again, normally economists have an incredible blind spot on the environment in their thinking. If we started from actually understanding the laws of thermodynamics, we would not have that blind spot. Um, and energy is essential for production. So you, to actually have production at all, you have to have energy. 
And what production does when you think about it in terms of entropy, it's going from high entropy to low entropy, which is the opposite of the direction in which the universe itself moves. So we take disordered stuff, raw materials and so on, and we turn it into ordered stuff, alienware computers and so on. And since we can't break the second law of thermodynamics, that means that production must be increasing disorder while it's creating products at the same time. So if you add up everything we're putting together in production, we're actually increasing disorder, even though what we exploit is a high level of order out of the system. So the question I started with, which is the value theory question, is how do economies, obviously growing economies, produce a surplus? How do we have more outputs and inputs every day in a, a growing capitalist economy, and in, indeed over to some extent over the history of humanity, well, it has to be compatible with the laws of thermodynamics. And the essential thing is there, to actually do that, we can't do it in a closed system. We have to be exploiting stuff which we simply find in the universe for free. So we are mining. The fundamental nature of production is not producing a surplus, it's mining energy that currently exists and turning part of that mining into stuff we want and dumping the rest that we don't want, but we dump it into our own backyard. So production is only possible on the Earth because it's an open system. And again, that's why I'm saying the, the, the circular flow diagrams are crap, because they imply you can produce stuff in a closed system. You simply can't do it. We're open because we receive incoming energy from the sun, uh, and we've got sword stellar energy, which we're exploiting as what well, we call fossil fuels, and we have stored cosmic energy as well, which we call nuclear fuels. So only because that stuff exists and it was there before we turned up, we didn't have to work to create it, only because that's there can we produce an output at all. And what we actually see in our own history, more outputs and inputs over time. So we, but we're necessarily creating disorder to do that. So we're dumping more waste back into the environment than we actually get as products out. So entropy has to increase over time. If you take a look at the raw materials and go to raw uh, find finished products plus all the waste properly accounted, there's an increase in disorder, which is one reason I'm rather sceptical about using carbon, uh, carbon pricing to try to restrain our uh, pumping of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. So with the, ex the, ent the properly counted, the entropy of what we're producing, everything has to exceed the entropy of what we start from even though what we get ourselves is a decrease in entropy in the products we actually consume. So we have to do a lot of revisions to economics to actually make it consistent here. First of all, we have to see the economy and the ecology is intimately linked. If we didn't have an ecology, we wouldn't have an economy either. And we have to be damaging the ecology in that sense to do production in the first place. That production necessarily requires energy and so labour and capital can't produce energy, but they can mine the energy that's there. And that mining goes everything from digging a hole in the ground to grabbing a banana off a tree. You can't substitute them for energy. You may find forms of labour and capital that improve the efficiency with which you exploit energy, but you cannot substitute them. This again was why I, was, I wasn't gobsmacked because he had a PhD in economics. Uh, the, this, the guy from the environmental you know, the United Nations Environmental Program. But the blind spot we've got is so great um, from economic theory, they, a lot of economists believe they can substitute labour and capital for energy as time goes on. No, you can't. Um, and you can't produce for that energy either. And this is a little insight that got me to the, the mathematics that I'll show you in the, in the next half of the lecture. The whole idea of treating labour and capital as inputs independent of energy is nonsense. Because labour without energy is a corpse, and capital without energy is a sculpture. You make the most elaborate machine in the world, if you don't provide energy to it, it won't do anything. It'll just sit there. So in that sense, labour and capital are both means to capture energy to make it do, to do work. But they can't do that work unless the energy exists in the first place. So you need three types of inputs. You need energy from the open system that the planet actually is. And that's either solar or, or stored nuclear. You need labour, which obviously has to have energy in it to be able to do anything, including taking notes in a lecture where the lecturer is speaking far too quickly. 
uh, and the machinery has to be using energy to actually do work in the first place. So those are all the prerequisites of getting a decent theory of value starting from thermodynamics and then out of that we can get an economic theory of value. And at that point, I'll stop for 10 minutes and we'll come back and keep on going to some slightly heavier stuff in the next half. Material for the length of the course that I'm giving, so I'm likely to be going over and giving more of a lecture than just your tutorial. But if you want to stop me and discuss at any point, please do. Okay. okay. So having looked at the inputs, which are three types, in energy being an essential input to both labour and capital that can do work, if we look at what we produce, we produce useful work. So we transform matter into useful products and services, and that can include literally direct application of energy to ourselves, if you sit beneath a heat lamp or something like that. Um, but normally it's using that energy to take something which isn't particularly useful and make it into something which is. Um, the very simplest illustration would be back taking a piece of wood and turning it into a bow and arrow. Okay? That takes energy to make that transformation. We also produce waste energy, which is unavoidable due to the laws of thermodynamics. We can't get away from that. We can reduce it by being more efficient over time, and certainly our machinery has become more efficient over time. That's the major innovation that um, James Watt did, by the way, in many ways, that a huge amount of energy was... There were steam engines before James Watt's steam engine, but one of the major innovations he did was uh, he had a separate condenser to cool the steam down, whereas other machines cooled down exactly the same thing they were heating up, and you wasted a huge amount of energy raising and lowering the temperature of the vessel which was boiling the water. He just had two separate condensers, dramatic increase in efficiency. Um, you're looking at Elon Musk these days. Anybody, I mean, you know, who are junkies watching SpaceX videos? I certainly am, okay? Well, we're going from throwing away a rocket every time we use it to reusing it 100 times. That's obviously an increase in efficiency. Those sorts of things that happen. But there's also waste products. And we necessarily burn, when we burn coal, we necessarily produce carbon dioxide. Um, we can reduce that waste by things like tooling technology. So if you look at um, manufacturing, it used to be what we now call big, big subtractive. So you take a sheet of metal, you'd cut something out of it, you'd throw away the stuff you didn't use, hopefully you might reprocess it and so on. When they're going to 3D printing where you reduce the tooling waste that's involved, but you still produce some waste. And some, you can recycle some of the waste, but you can't recycle all of it. There are some things which, if you recycle, you'll kill somebody. Okay? You don't want to recycle cyanide, for example. So there's waste we simply can't, have, can't avoid. So to try to put a visual handle on this, we start with the environment, so we're working inside the biosphere. We haven't yet left the biosphere. That's one potential alternative to the limitations we currently face. We can produce a surplus of, of goods as we perceive them, more outputs than inputs, because we've got all this free energy coming in from the sun. We have stored solar energy in the form of coal and oil and so on, and gas, and we have stored nuclear waste, which we can also exploit. Um, that powers the economy, and labour and capital are then the means by which we harness that. And since I worked out the equation I'll be showing you, I've, I've started rethinking in ways which end up being consistent with historians, how we can actually see human history as improving our capacity to capture energy and therefore going from the days we used to capture each other, slavery, to be able to exploit the energy to where now we, we are now actually collectively exploit what some um, physicists call energy slaves. In fact, rather than labour exploiting capital or vice versa, we're both exploiting energy slaves which take the form of the fossil fuels particularly we're using right now. So we use labour and capital to harness that energy and produce output, but we necessarily produce waste as well, which is both physical and energy waste. Um, and they're both things we absolutely can't avoid, and there's some stuff we can avoid to some degree, but we simply get to a point where there's no poss possibility to reduce the efficiency, reduce the inefficiency below a certain level. And of course, the, tech, the state of technology has been changing over time as well dramatically. And we dump this waste back into the biosphere. Of course, we could also, some centuries in the future maybe, dump the waste into the vacuum of space. 
And that's rather a more desirable place to get to. But at the moment, we dump it in the biosphere, which is why we're having such fun with people like Donald Trump trying to understand global warming. So useful work also necessarily has waste. And this overall production is increasing entropy, making things more disordered, even though we're enjoying a high level of order in the products we actually consume. And of course, the danger we face right now is the biosphere slows down how fast those waste products are transmitted back off the planet. So the planet's out of thermo uh, energetic equilibrium, temperature is rising. And that applies even without global warming, by the way. There's a, uh, there's a wonderful um, website. I'm not sure that I actually included in these lectures that Tim and I were just talking about it a moment ago. But there's a, to just talk about how big the gap is between what physicists understand and what economists understand. Um, is there's a blog post called Finite Physicist Meets Exponential Economist. And uh, search for that. And it's a wonderful uh, record of a discussion by the physicist of a conversation with a leading economist uh, and showing how little the economist, you know, PhD in lots of publications and so on, knew about energy. And it's how much his mind was changed by a conversation with the physicist over time. As part of this, he points out, even if there were no global warming, so there was zero trapping of heat by water vapour, carbon dioxide, etc., cetera, um, at the rate we're using energy, if we extrapolate that into a future, even if our population stabilises, so we look at the per capita increase, I think in about, let's see, I think it was about 450 years, let's see. No, okay. Uh, 100 degrees. Let's see. I'm not finding what I'm looking for. Yeah, uh, the current rate of energy growth over time, the temperature of the planet would be would reach the boiling point of water in 400 years. Okay. So in other words, what we're doing is not sustainable. Okay. That's without global warming. That's simply the, the entropy, the increase in waste heat that we're dumping into the environment. Without the environment there to begin with, the temperature we'd be dumping into the, under the planet itself would make the planet's surface on average the same as the boiling point of water in 400 years, which is a lot sooner than most economists think they're going to be problems. So can we make economics consistent with those laws of thermodynamics? Well, I don't think we can see make the neoclassicals that way because for a start, they're starting from a subjective theory of value. They're saying value is all about increasing utility. They're not even beginning with the argument about how do you produce a physical surplus. So they don't explain how that's possible in terms of the physical process of increasing utility. And they have production functions that say output is a function of technology, labour and capital. So you've all seen the Cobb-Douglas production function. Now, output, as shown as Y, is some strange uh, amalgam called A, which changes over time, multiplied by labour to the raised to one power times capital one minus that power when you have constant returns to scale. Uh, there's no explicit role for energy there. Now, if you include, they try to say, well, energy is another form of capital, which is false because you can't make energy. We do make machines. You can't make energy. It's false to classify energy as a form of capital. Um, and the production function they have is the mirror image of their model in consumption. If you think about what you taught, taught in neoclassical theory of consumption, you can easily substitute commodities to generate utility. You have you know, more cake and less coffee and vice versa and get the same level of satisfaction. That's the ice indifference curves. They use ISIC once, exactly the same concept. Um, it's not necessarily, it's not inherently wrong to model consumption that way, but modeling production that way argues you can easily substitute inputs around. Now, if you think about labor and capital um, as a neoclassical way, they're easily substitutable. And in fact, most of the productivity comes from labor when they try to measure where the productivity comes from. Uh, and you can substitute one for the other. You cannot substitute like capital and labor for energy. Okay? You can use capital and labor that more efficiently harness the energy that's available or that harness more energy, but you cannot substitute them just not possible. 
So it's inherently wrong at that level. And they also have this notion of perfect this and perfect that. At the same time, of course, they say they're value free. Now, if I say something is perfect, am I being value free? In the sense of having a value judgment? Of course not. So their terminology is a load of nonsense. But certainly the idea that you can have wasteless production is wrong. But the main problem is that the theory of income distribution they have says you get your marginal product. You get back what you put in, effectively. You get, you get back the input of the final... You get the contribution of the final input of your class of productive technology, whether it's capital getting its rate of interest as the marginal product or workers getting their wage as the marginal product of labour. It's linking the payment you get to your contribution. It's a meritocratic theory. Um, and incomes completely account for output. Now... When you include energy, which is not manufactured, we're not paying the sun for producing the crops. Okay? So in that sense, you no longer have labour and capital. Labour and capital do not account for all output by any stretch of imagination. Prices don't match marginal uh, products anymore. So the theory just simply can't be made to conform. If you actually use their equations to make it, uh, to update their equations to include energy, which I have done that I'll do later in the lecture, you don't get something which will give you their theory of distribution. Okay? You break the link between the two. And that's a fairly major revision of the theory. Um, I think only one school's ever been correct, and that's the school I mentioned earlier on, the physiocrats. And they predate Adam Smith. In fact, Adam Smith went to France uh, as a tutor for a young, wealthy uh, the son of a lord, and met Canet, who's the, the most well-known of the physiocrats. So Smith was actually influenced by them and could have built on what they did, but I think fundamentally he didn't understand what they were doing. So part of what the physiocrats looked at was the whole idea of circulation because Canet was the king's doctor. In fact, he ceased doing any medical work not long after he started working for the king, but he was a, a physician at the time. They were doing autopsies, which for a while was a no-no. You had all these corpses everywhere, all the military battles, but you weren't allowed to touch the body because that was sacrosanct. Then they started doing autopsies on dead bodies and finding all the cables and seeing the idea of circulation of blood and so on in the body. So they built a circulatory model of that. And in fact, you can see this is really the very first work of macroeconomics. Uh, but they also, the part which, there's a, that, that particular part of their work, this idea of a circulatory model of Capitalism come out of a, kind of applying what physicians saw in the body to the economy. People are still very complimentary about that. But one thing people are normally critical of is say, well, they saw all surpluses coming from agriculture, and clearly that's wrong. Well, in fact, when you look at it properly, I think they're the only ones who really got it right, because their argument was that agriculture is the only industry that receives the in quoted. This is actually a quote you'll find quite frequently in the physiocrats: the free gift of nature. So because they were writing at the time when France was still overwhelmingly an agricultural nation, of course they had tools, agricultural tools, they had some factories and so on, but they weren't as industrialised at this stage as England was. It also predated the steam engine, so we didn't have steam producing, meaning we can actually harness the energy of coal. Uh, so we think if you had engines, if you had furnaces, they were often wood-fired and so on. Uh, but they didn't see any sense of the free gift in the nature. So this is, I think this is Turgo saying that the husbandman, as they call the farmer, is the only one whose industry produces more than the wages of his labour. Okay. And why does he do it? Because he gets the free gift of nature. So they say, because you're getting this free gift, they didn't quite... They did, the word energy, by the way, was not invented until 1809. And these people are writing in the late 1600s and early early to middle to late 1700s. So the whole, if you won't find the word energy there because it didn't exist. So in some ways, they had insights before we had the concepts to get a handle on those insights. So they're saying the soil, independent of any other man, pays him immediately the price of his toil. In other words, you're getting something free from the soil. Now we now know, of course, that that soil is capturing solar energy through plants doing photosynthesis and then the plants grow and they take nutrients out of the soil, etc., etc. So it really goes back to exploiting the sun. I'm still trying to find a quote where that's said 
precisely by one of the physiocrats. I know there's one somewhere. But they're saying nature is a physical consequence of the fertility of the soil. This is Turgo in 1795. So yeah. I've, actually, I think it's, I've got to check the date of publication there. It might be publication date after he wrote it. But that's the idea. Agriculture gets this free gift. Nobody else gets the free gift. They, everybody, other industry must be producing less than its wages. Okay. Now, that's an idea that we're actually mining in that sense without quite understanding it because, of course, the physics simply didn't exist then. But in a sense, they were right <coughs> about we only produce an output because we get a free gift from nature. And rather than being nature of the soil, it's nature of the sun that lets us actually get that free gift. So this is the, the opening sentence from um, Cantillon's book. And notice how much this is very much like Smith's own wording, but he changes what he says is the source of value. Land is the source of matter from which all wealth is drawn. Man's labour provides the form of its production. And wealth is nothing but the food, conveniences and pleasures of life. That's incredibly similar to the way that Smith starts it. I wouldn't include Smith of plagiarism. Yes, I would. Uh, but what he changed was he changed from land to labour. I think that was what really set economics off on a very, very bad path. So the physiocrats say production requires what the earth produces as a free gift, which, of course, is predominantly the free gift we get this from the sun itself. And this is, I think, a beautiful expression of the role of this exploiting what already exists, stuff we didn't produce ourselves, to therefore be able to produce goods and services we can consume. The produce of the land divides into two parts. The one is the subsistence and profits of the husbandman, which the reward for his labour, and the conditions on which he agrees to work for the proprietor. So the husbandman is actually the, the farming, the, the labourer working on the proprietor's land in this case. The other, which remains, is the independent disposable bit, which the earth produces as a free gift. And that's what the proprietor gets the benefit of. So by owning the land, you can take the free gift you get from the land, which again we source back to the sun. That's actually a valid theory of production. Now, this is extremely hard to see. I have a little device. I think I forgot to plug this one in, but I'll see if I can get it working just to zoom in a bit there. Let's see. Okay. I'm going to zoom there as you get. Okay, here we go. Okay. That's called the productive workers, and that's all the input of agriculture. Over here he's got the sterile. You can see the work. I'll go back up one and get one of the animations out of the way. So that's, that's productive. That's agriculture. This is sterile. Okay. And as they were writing at the time, it was valid to make that point because we didn't know at that time what coal and oil were. And of course, what they fundamentally are is animal matter, which was refined by geological processes, still containing the energy the animal matter had when it died, and we then used that to produce work, and the energy itself came initially from the sun. So that says both manufacturing and agriculture can exploit the free gift of nature. But looking at the time they did, they thought it's only agriculture that does it. What manufacturing does is take what agriculture produces and change its form. Okay. It doesn't actually add any value. That was wrong, but the actual fundamental insight that production comes from uh, the sun is correct. And they're writing this back in 1758. So it predates the Industrial Revolution, predates Smith, it predates us exploiting solar energy in the form of coal and oil, and it predates the theory of relativity and nuclear energy. So lots of things we can't criticise them for not knowing. But I think the true advantage is they got it right. And Smith led us astray by saying labour was the source and energy drops out of the picture before it's even in the picture. Okay? With the physiocrats, at least, in a refined sense, energy was in there, even though they couldn't use the word. So they saw the sun as a source of energy, um, we now know we have, a, we have a stored level. So the value is actually degraded as a concept as well. If you read neoclassical theory, it's about uh, how relative price is set. That's really what their value theory is about. Classicals is what's the source of profit 
Okay, so Marx is talking about where does profit come from, accepting that a surplus can be produced. Um, the physiocrats were really saying, how do we produce a physical surplus? So they think, I think they, they're the only ones who got the question right, and when I finally write my magnum opus on economics, it's going to start by saying Smith was not the father of economics, he led economics astray. In that sense, if anybody is the father of economics, it's Cantillon. So they're asking the question, how do we transform inputs into outputs where the outputs are greater than the inputs in both quantity and quality? So we're going from low entropy, which is high order. This appears to, you know, I'm just repeating myself a bit here. Um, but this is the point. We're producing more outputs than inputs. So the physiocrats said, agriculture exploits the free energy of the sun. So that's the productive sector. Other sectors simply transform it into some other form. Now, they were right to say that it's transforming the free energy. They were wrong to say that agriculture is the only one that can do it. But that's why they made that division between productive and sterile systems. And they divided society into three classes. They had productive class, which is agricultural workers, and they're creating value because of that free gift, as you saw from Cantillon and Turgo earlier. And we think one reason why they could see it was actually because of the state of French industry at the time. It was overwhelmingly agriculture, more so substantially than England at the time. And if you plant one seed corn, you get a whole plant. Put that down in the ground, solar energy comes along, transforms that from a seed into a plant, given life's own existence itself, and that plant has got obviously a surplus. So in that sense, it was the, the fact that the, you could compare the inputs to the outputs, and they exactly some of the inputs were exactly the same as the outputs. There was more outputs than inputs. The visibility of the surface, I think, was clearer to them than it was to Smith. So the sterile class was the industrial workers. They were seen as transforming value, and proprietors were the owners. That's that's the class structure they had. So they were wrong to think that agriculture is the only one that can harness that energy, but they were right to start from energy itself and in that sense. And only processes that exploit that energy can actually produce surplus output. So you have to have an open system. This is the difference between an open and a closed system is fairly obvious. Open can take in energy from somewhere else. A closed system can only use what's currently contained in it. And therefore a closed system will necessarily degrade over time. You can make it do some work while it does the degradation but ultimately it will cease doing work and you'll have a less ordered system coming out of it. So that insight the physiocrats had was lost when we started saying labour is the source of surplus. And if you... The physiocrats saw the necessary role of labour in transforming what came in, but that was a much deeper insight than we got out of Smith and then out of Ricardo and then out of uh, Marx and so on. So here is... You know, a very similar wording. I think there's actually, that isn't the first sentence from Smith, but he puts labour where Cantillon has land. Um, and it's all focusing upon labour and the division of labour. And then you got instantly out of that argument, if you think of it from the worker's point of view, well, if we're the source of surplus, why do capitalists get anything? And you start getting an intellectual basis for the class conflict of the 19th century, which is a false basis. With Marx, this is this Smith again saying the value of any commodity is equal to the quantity of labour that it lets somebody purchase, whereas Cantillon's argument was the value of any commodity is the amount of land that went into producing it. Strictly speaking, Cantillon was more act more correct in terms of the laws of exchange, the laws of thermodynamics. Anyway, of labour is the real measure of the exchangeable value of all commodities. Wrong. Okay. In that fundamental sense, we've got to bring it back to energy and, and uh, as the physiocrats saw it at the time, as land. Now, that led ultimately to the argument that labour is the source of what Turgo called the revenue, which is the surplus of outputs over inputs. So you read Marx on this front. This is, I think, from um, Wage, Labour and Capital. So the worker receives means of subsistence in exchange for labour power, but the capitalist receives... Uh, the productivity of the worker and that creative power is greater than the surplus going in, therefore the capitalist is exploiting the worker. <coughs> now, certainly there's social exploitation going on there, 
Uh, but it was wrong to say that Labor is the source of that surplus. And that led, you know, the, the huge conflicts we've had, not just in the 20th and 19th century, but also the neoclassicals coming out and largely in response to that. So the neoclassical response was to say, well, Labor is no more important than capital. They both contribute to production. They both get their marginal products. They ignore the question of a physical surplus, um, but they and clearly have no role for energy. But we need to have that role for energy in there. So how do we bring it in? Well, post-Keynesians reject the idea that you can substitute the factors. They talk about a, a fixed ratio between labour and capital. Uh, but they've also got no explicit role for energy. So what I want to do is show you how you can bring that in. So production is a process where you take free energy and transform matter or energy into some more organised form than it was beforehand, with the cost of producing uh, necessarily rising entropy over time as well. That's what we're actually doing. Um, so labour and capital are means to actually harness that energy. So you can't exploit the free energy without them. If you don't have labour, you don't have machinery, the energy that's sitting there can't be used at all. But they can't add value <coughs> of their own. They are not adding more value than they've got inside them. It simply is impossible. Um, so how to bring it in in some essential way? Well, I'm still working on this paper. I've got a lot of sensible comments from referees about how to revise it. But you've got to make energy an absolutely essential input. And the basic idea is, without energy in the other theories of production, um, you've got to be able to bring energy in, in an essential way without changing the theory itself drastically. So if you have the labour theory of value, the argument is the surplus is derived from a proportional to the labour input. The neoclassicals are saying there's output by substitutable factors of production, but no role for energy in there. The post-Keynesians have an idea of having some fixed proportion between capital and, la and, and labour, so that what you produce is a minimum of either a capital output ratio or labour productivity times labour. Uh, what most people have done to try to bring um, energy in and this is, hang on, what happened there? I just pressed the letter B, I think. Okay, back again. Sorry. Um, I've got to go into more detail on this uh, over, as I'm writing the paper I'm working on right now. But if you look at what's up here, you've got output is some strange factor called A times labour to one power times capital to another. So labour and capital are treated as two independent inputs. What people have often done in trying to bring energy in is say, well, it's capital, it's labour, and it's also energy. Okay? So tack energy on as a third factor. Now, I was never very happy with that because if you set alpha and beta, if alpha and beta are in sum equal to one, then energy, the exponent of energy would become zero, and therefore that would just be the constant one. And you'd be talking about it being able to produce output with no energy. So it's still not satisfactory to put it at that level. And the insight that I got that let me develop a decent equation at the start of one is that you can't even talk about labour and capital without also talking about the energy they're using at the time. So, again, the comment I made to you earlier, labour without energy is a corpse, capital without energy is a sculpture. Therefore, what they are is means to harness the free energy we find in nature. And now think about GDP. We have all sorts of messy definitions for GDP involving price indices and attempts to remove inflation over time. Uh, and people say, well, GDP, you know, if you have a car accident, GDP rises because of the you know, paramedics involved and the hospital operations and so on. But think about GDP as useful work. That's fundamentally what it is. We're getting something, we're using energy to produce stuff which is useful. So it's useful work. So that's GDP. And see, so GDP in that sense is turning energy into something useful. And it needs capital, which harnesses energy, and labour, which harnesses energy to do it. So that's the most general way of writing that relationship. So the amount of work they can actually do depends upon how many units you're working with. Now, of course, at Kingston, you will learn that you can't talk about capital in the abstract. You know, you can't add capital together in the idea of a neoclassical production function, but I'm going to use that abstraction for a while. 
So you can count labour in terms of the number of workers, the number of hours of work they do as you know, unskilled work and so on. Um, you can count K in some hypothetical way. But there's then the amount of energy that are harnessed by labour and capital. And the ratio of the amount of energy that the machine or the human being needs themselves to stay alive. So if you're going to stay barely functional, just able to, to breathe and wake up the next morning, you need about 1,500 to 2,000 calories to do that. That's your basal rate of energy consumption. To do work, you've got to eat more than that, and then that extra energy you eat in can be used to do useful work. Okay. So there's a ratio, if you look at humans, you could roughly say if you're going to work as a hard physical labour, you might be able to put out 2,000 calories of energy in a day, and you're going to need 2,000 calories to, for yourself as well. So there's a ratio between the energy you can actually put into work and the energy you need, which is 0.5 in that particular case. That's the simplest way of looking at available energy to actual total energy, and that's part of the idea of waste. And I'm still playing around with the terms here, but I think it's valid to try to define efficiency in terms of an absolute standard of efficiency. So, for example, uh, the ultimate level of efficiency would be to get, in terms of the lights we've got inside this room as it now turns dark, in the UK, enough photons to be able to read the paper you're looking at. Okay? That would be the ultimate definition of efficiency versus the number of photons actually generated because some of the light's going outside the window, some of it's generating heat, much more so on the days of incandescent light bulbs, of course. But I think it makes sense to talk about a, an absolute scale of efficiency there as well. So what I do is expand that expression out. So I'm going from this expression up here just generally saying capital harnessing energy and labour harnessing energy, saying we now have several parts to that. So there's the amount, of, the number of machines, inverted commas, times the energy that each machine can process, times how much of the energy they need can actually be turned into useful work versus energy needed to maintain the machine. That's partly the entropy issues I was talking about for, beforehand, times the efficiency, and exactly the same thing for labour. And if I multiply it out, I've got the number of machines times the energy machines can consume. Obviously, that's risen dramatically from our very first machines right through to the machines we use today. If you imagine the amount of energy that a, a, a James Watt steam engine could use was something of the order of 10 tonnes of coal per day. The amount of energy used by a Falcon 9 rocket is 10 tonnes of fuel or nine tonnes of fuel, I think, per second. Okay. That's a you know, 20, 30,000 times increase in the amount of energy, a typical, not typical, but a, a, a sort of iconic machine can generate. So that's my energy coming in. I use little x and subscript k for this ratio of, of useful work to total energy, and then e times k for the efficiency with which it's done. So again, imagine if I wanted to get a weight from a one kilo weight from here to the end of the room, moving say one kilo about 10 metres, I could do it with perfect efficiency, no friction, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There'd be amount of energy I'd impart to start the thing moving, amount of energy to stop it. That'd be my ultimate maximum efficiency. Then I could compare that to putting it on, pushing it on the carpet and dragging with all the friction involved in that or putting it on a, on a wheel and rolling it there and make comparisons like that to talk about how efficiently we're using that energy. I want to play around with this a bit here because imagine we put this in the same form the neoclassicals use, which is the Cobb-Douglas production function. And I'm substituting inside K raised to the alpha and L raised to the 1 minus alpha. I've now got the number of machines times the energy machines can use, which of course is dependent upon what point in history I'm talking about, times the exergy energy ratio. Exergy, by the way, is the is useful energy. So there's also, uh, the term energy was only invented in 1809, and in the 20th century, a lot of people working in this field started coming up with variations. Exergy, talking about useful energy. Energy, I've forgotten what the hell that's supposed to mean. That's all very confusing, but this is... Effectively, that point I was talking about beforehand, um, 
plus the embellishment that if you want to have a machine, you've got to maintain it, the machine will have depreciation. So the energy that's going into the machine can't all be harnessed. Part has to go to maintain the machine as well. But that's putting it in exactly the neoclassical form, and I want to see what happens if we play around with the algebra here. So you rearrange that, you get the cobb douglas production function sitting out here. You then get the energy contribution of the machine and the energy contribution of labour as separate terms. So here's your cobb douglas production function, which is what the neoclassicals normally have. There's the energy parameters for labour, and we can actually play with that and say, what are they? Well, maybe 4,000 calories a day is a reasonable <coughs> estimate for the amount of energy that somebody working as an unskilled worker on average can handle. 2,000 of those calories are going to be your basal rate plus a bit, so you can actually survive. You don't die by, over time by working as an unskilled labourer. Maybe your efficiency might be 0.5. You're raising it to a power as well in the expression there. But you can basically say it's a constant. You don't need to really worry about it because that has not risen dramatically over time. In fact, it probably has fallen over time. Think about the amount of work that a slave put in back in ancient Rome versus the amount of work we put in. Now I imagine the efficiency with which we do our work is rather lower than slaves were compelled to do. And that's just showing a graph of how the relationship of um, the value of... of the, if you look at, at, multiply the terms out, you get a 1,000 calories is my first argument. You're raising it to a power. I'm just showing the graph there. That's not particularly important. But the important one is energy parameters for capital because... If you go back to, um, again, the James Watt steam engine, the iconic machine of that time, 10 tonnes of coal per day, roughly. Okay? Iconic machine of our time, billions, thousands of, thousands of tonnes of oil equivalent uh, versus a handful in that sense. And the XK, the ratio of useful work to work to maintain the machine, that's time varying as well. And that can rise or fall. If you think about how efficient <coughs> cars are now versus how efficient cars were before OPEC, okay. they were a lot more efficient now than they were then. Now, over time, before the OPEC price hike occurred for oil, efficiency may well have been falling. Okay. Didn't care about it because gas was cheap. Now we care about it because gas has become expensive. So that would vary up and down. And so would the efficiency. So when you put that all together, you now get a formula like this. And I've used, I'm using the, that upside down V is actually the Greek, the Greek letter for L. So I've got some constant, which doesn't really matter, times the number of workers raised to one minus alpha times the machines raised to alpha, all pretty much the same as the Cobb-Douglas production function. But it's now times the energy contribution of machinery. So that's what I see fundamentally where most of our increase in wealth has come from. So the cobb douglas production function is just this lot. Um, and if you heard of what's called the Solo residual, when Robert Solo first developed his version of the neoclassical growth formula back in the 1950s, in then trying to fit that equation for labour and capital producing output to the actual data, they found about 85% of it couldn't be explained. So 85% of it ended up in the A term, which has got all sorts of weird characteristics to it when you say what actually does A actually stand for. But from this point of view, what A stands for is the energy contribution of machinery. And obviously that's why so much of a contribution has been found in the energy side rather than labour or capital, because what we've been doing over time is increasing the amount of energy we can use to get work done. If you think about the amount of energy you people have used to get to this class, well, however you got here, whether it's by motorbike or by car or by public transport, the amount of energy used to move you whatever distance you did would be the amount of energy a king would have used two centuries ago. Okay. They're getting that much wealth out of the energy we're exploiting. That's the major source of the wealth we currently enjoy. Now, I'm going to play with my own equation a bit further here because, as I mentioned, most people who've tried to bring energy in have just added it as an extra factor. So you have K to the alpha, L to the beta, E to the 1 minus alpha minus beta. That's 
not just Kamalayas, but a few others have done the same thing over time. Well, there are three, there are two terms here, alpha, beta, and one minus alpha minus beta, if you're working with constant returns to scale. I've only got one term, which actually means it's harder to fit my equation to data because there's only one term to vary. But it's also possible to put that equation into proportional terms, and I've done it rather too quickly here, but if I divide through by labour on both sides, I eliminate um, the, actually, I won't worry about that one so much more, it's more when I talk about perp machine. Um, let's see, pardon me jumping, I'm just realising I've got a bit of a potential error there, so I have to come back to it. But, yeah, sorry. Do you not also have the same problem that you can have a zero contribution of energy in your... No, because if you set the if you set the exponent to and this is this is the point that I've got the one degree. If you set that if you set that exponent to zero, you've also set that exponent to zero, and you're saying all that's produced by labour and nothing by machinery. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So in this expression, if you set alpha and beta to sum to one, then that becomes either the one minus one, which is e to the zero, which is one. Okay. But if you set this to being zero, then you're also saying capital is also raised to zero, so all output's produced by labour. Okay? You can't get rid of energy. If you get rid of energy in my equation, you also get rid of machinery. So you can't eliminate it. Get the point? Yeah. So what I'm going to do here is a bit messy, but I, I, I want to... Unfortunately, I'm, I've got a, a term here which... Um, is Greek, and the Greek E is almost like the Roman E, so you can't quite see it. But what I've got here is I've got capital, which is an abstract idea. How many machines are there? How do we add machines up? That's all the capital controversies material, which I presume Engelbert or somebody else has mentioned to you here already. But this is the energy per machine. Now, I know if I'm talking about the Watt steam engine, there might have been, you know, a 1,000 of them sometime in the UK, and each of them could turn me 10 tonnes of coal per day. Um, but when you talk about multiple machines, how do you add the energy used by a laptop computer to the energy used by a lamp, et cetera, et cetera? It becomes very problematic. So we don't actually have a decent measure of how many machines there are. We don't have a decent measure of energy per machine. We do know how much energy is used in production in total because that's actually recorded by... Let's actually bring up this document here. Engineers have recorded this, how much energy we use in production, because most energy, of course, goes in the form of, um, of um, electricity these days, how much electricity goes in. You can convert coal into energy, electricity equivalent, etc., etc. This is actually the form used by the uh, Department of Energy in the United States to measure this information. But we do actually know how much energy is used in um, in production. So if I now substitute the total energy used rather than K times E to the K, so which we don't, we don't know what K is, we don't know E to the K for every machine, but we do know the total amount of energy used in production overall. So I can substitute that now and get rid of capital completely. I'm now saying output is produced by labour raised to 1 minus alpha times total energy raised to the alpha times these efficiency terms here. Let's play with it a bit more. That's talking in terms of total output. What about if I divide through by how many people there are? So if you divide through by population, you're now talking per capita output, and you've now got the same term. I've divided the energy by, by N, but if I, I can split the N into and divide L by N, which now gives me the employment rate, and energy by population, which is energy per head, I now get an expression where I can relate GDP per capita to the employment rate times energy per head raised to this power of alpha times the efficiency in the energy ratio and efficiency. And that's actually something we can fit to the data. We do have data on all those elements, except we don't have data on the efficiency over here. We do know total energy used by um, American industry and also a range of 
EU countries as well for some substantial time period. So to show you what I can do out of that, this is GDP per head in the United States in $1960. rising with an obvious dip when the financial crisis hit. This is the employment rate, which actually, one reason I regard Donald Trump as having won the election, because the employment rate peaked in 2000. And even though we've had recoveries, of, that was the 2007 peak, that's where we were in 2016. It's slightly higher now. But in fact, the employment rate's actually fallen in America. It, it peaked way back in 2000, is now declining. Yeah. This is including Pardon? this is including like zero hour contracts in the gig economy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It, it, there's, if you look at the unemployment data, the unemployment data is collected by surveys. We go and knock on people's doors and ask them, "Are you working or are you not?" Question one. If that's all they did, it'd be valid survey. They then say, "Have you looked for work in the last two weeks?" If you answer no to that question, you're not in the workforce. Okay. Whereas the employment data asks factories, how many workers have you got at some point in time? So the employment data is actually much more reliable than the unemployment data, particularly in America. Um, energy consumption by head. I got quite a shock when I saw this chart because I thought it was going to stuff up my correlations completely. But energy per head in terms of kilograms of oil equivalent per year, the top of that graph is 8,500 kilograms of uh, energy per year, that's energy consumption per head in the United States and it peaked at about that level back in 1979. So since that period, it's a huge drop off in response to the OPEC price rise and also the recession that occurred at the same time. Then a rising amount of energy peaking back in 2000 again and then since 2000 also falling quite sharply. So I've got, I, when I saw this data, I thought I'm going to have a hard time fitting my equation to the data here. It's not going to do all that well. Um, but interestingly enough, this, this is a very messy chart to read, but what I've got there is GDP per capita, and the, that's the annual change in GDP per capita. So zero is across here. So you can see it was negative during the, the recession and so on. Um, there's a strong correlation just to employment alone there's a strong correlation to energy alone, but my equation increases as a higher correlation than either of those factors left alone and a higher correlation than the Cobb-Douglas production function. So this, uh, this way of seeing it, even a very simplistic way of representing it, I'm doing some work some, with some econometricians now to do a better quality, much better quality than I can do, empirical fitting of this to data across a range of countries. But it as well as being more logical, it's also a better fit for the data, which I, I think is rather essential. And if you look at the expression in general here, I'm going back to the total output form rather than GDP per capita form, you get each of these gives you an element about the nature of a capitalist economy. So you have energy is necessarily included in the expression, which is left out of all the others. Um, with labour, your employment rate, you're talking about the, effectively the class struggle between workers and capitalists, the level of employment, the rate of economic activity, and you're talking about distribution of income as well. So it's a foundation in that sense for looking at all the elements we need to understand to understand a capitalist economy. And it should be possible to link this with ecology as well. I haven't started trying to work on that, but clearly because production produces waste and necessarily entropy rises, then you can link it at the very outset to what is the impact of our production on the ecology as well. So a long, long way to go, but I think we're on the way to a, uh, a feasible theory of production, and it's not neoclassical. So I've got a, a bit more to cover here before I... Actually, I might just... Uh, I'll cover a few more points and I'll take a bit of a break and we'll talk a bit more about how this lot's gone down. Yeah? May I have a I'm going to yeah. my kids in school. Sorry, sorry, yeah. May I have a problem? So a range of things became obvious to me when I put this together, and that is that explaining where the vast increase in output has come from, it's largely because we're harnessing so much more energy. Now, it's obvious when you say it, but it's not something which is obvious from economic theory. And we don't pay energy for the contribution it makes. 
So the payment goes to the owner of the energy, not to the source of the energy in the first instance. And what we've got in terms of a class struggle is not capitalists exploiting workers or workers exploiting capitalists, whichever way you look at it. It's we're both exploiting the surplus we generate from, from taking advantage of the energy we find in the universe, and we're fighting over the shares of it. <coughs> and in that sense, the amount of what we're getting back is far greater than the marginal product of either form. Okay? Uh, and there's a nice way to quantify this. Apparently, the amount of energy that you can put into work is roughly equivalent to a 90-watt um, incandescent light globe. Now, if you work out how many incandescent light globes the average American enjoys in the sense of the amount of electric power they experience, it's about 11,000 of those light bulbs. So we are getting far more back than we're putting in. And that again comes to the fact we're mining this free energy. What we're doing is fighting over how much goes to workers and how much goes to capitalists and how much goes to bankers. So it's a major revision of how you think about where production comes from, what is the nature of social conflict, and also what's the role of economics and the ecology. So putting it this through the mill of economic theory, the neoclassical theory would go because an essential part of that theory is a meritocratic theory of income distribution. You get your marginal product. No, you don't. You get far more than it. Okay? But then how much you get depends upon your class relationship, how much power do workers have compared to capitalists. Now, post-Keynesian production function... Oh, my God, that's terribly small, that tech, so it'll work on that. But if you look at the post-Keynesian production functions... It's talking about an output being a minimum of the capital output ratio or labour productivity times labour. And you can rewrite write that to say that there's some utilisation rate times the capital labour ratio, which will be equal to labour productivity times labour. You can make it energy aware by saying, well, output's actually proportional to the amount of energy that is harnessed by the machinery to do useful work. And employment's proportional to the output. And we know that the energy input to machinery has grown dramatically over time, whereas the energy input we put into production, labour, has actually declined. If you go back to um, slave societies, the energy that was exploited by the masters back then was quite literally the calories that the workers, that the slaves, could put into moving the kings and queens around. So there was a very direct relationship between the number of calories slaves could actually put into useful work and the amount of useful work harnessed by the ruling class. But these days, we're harnessing what machines can do. And the amount of work you put in, the work is now put in, is pressing the buttons on the machines. It's no longer the calorie input anymore. It's really the, the workers' role is to control the machines. And in a sense, workers get a wage because they can blackmail the capitalists to say, if you don't pay us a decent wage, we don't press the buttons. Okay. It's not that their individual calorie workers anywhere near as necessary as it was back in the days of slave society. So what I've done here is saying I can now take this expression here and expand out and say, well, this is actually the energy being used by machinery times the efficiency with which it's used, and the amount of labour we use is going to be proportional to the amount of output, we, the amount of energy being harnessed, and the energy coming from machinery is growing exponentially over time. So, at um, that, that point, I'm going to take a bit of a break and talk about that. And then the final bit of the lecture is leading into what I'm talking about next week, which is taking Marx's philosophy of dialectics and trying to put an overall framework for understanding capitalism from that philosophy rather than neoclassical utilitarianism. So, any, let's take a bit of a Okay. I'm going to interrupt those conversations again. I'm sorry. But just quickly to this is pretty much a prelude to next next week because I want to say how do we actually make this into a theory of value? What do we what do we do to have a way of being able to understand the complexity of the society we're in? Because clearly that's what we're trying to do with economic theory. We're trying to get a way of understanding the social system and the production system in which we live. And I'm, I'm with the classical school of thought in rejecting 
the idea of a subjective theory as the basis for that, which is what the neoclassicals use and the Austrians use because the reality is we start from a quantitative theory. We are using energy, which we can measure as a quantitative thing, to do work, which we can also measure as a quantitative thing. Production embodies the energy we've got in the universe. We can, we can work out how many uh, watts we're getting per second from the sun, how much of that can we actually use, what are we using, etc. They're all quantitative. So is the increase in entropy. They're all quantitative elements. And that, to me, rules out using either a neoclassical or an Austrian subjective theory of value as your starting point. Now, you still have to get subjective concepts turning up there at some point. You've got to have some way of being able to understand why people pay the prices they will for paintings, for example, why they'll pay the prices they do for shares, which is not going to come down to the objective value of the painting or the objective value of the shares. The post-Keynesians have generally said, they've thrown their hands up in horror at it, and have uh, a good friend of mine, actually my PhD, one of my PhD examiners, Jeff Harcourt, um, wrote a paper called Horses for Courses, which said you just use whatever theory makes the best sense. You know, you're very pragmatic about what you choose. Well, all very well, but in fact, post-Keynesians spend a lot of their time criticising neoclassical methodology. And one neoclassical author came back with a very obvious point in saying, well, if it's Horses for Courses, why is a neoclassical horse never appropriate? Okay. On what basis can you say, let's be agnostic about a theory of value and agnostic about method, while saying agnosticism means 100% never use neoclassical? So that's not valid either. You've got to have a, I think the neoclassical, the post Keynesians have to develop a theory of value as well, even though they've resisted it so far. And you will find there are elements of that in some neoclassical literature called organicism. So a guy called, well, Tony Lawson, you probably know Tony Lawson's name from uh, Critical Realism. But also Roy Rothheim, uh, Ted Winslow, I've actually met Ted recently, I think it's Ted, have I got the name right? Mark Lavoie as well, argue that there's an organic philosophy underlying Marx's ideas, and this, uh, sorry, Marx and Keynes' ideas, and the philosopher that Marx was relying upon was largely Whitehead. And Winslow does a beautiful job of characterising what Keynes' perspective was, which is that the characteristics of an entity such as worker, such as capitalist, such as a product and so on, are the outcomes of its relationships with other entities. Now that's fundamentally what complex systems is about as well. The main characteristics of something aren't how you describe it itself in isolation, it's how it interacts with everything else it's involved with. But that then means, how the hell do you handle that complexity? Okay, if everything depends on everything else, where the hell do you start? Okay. Well. Whitehead said that there's a nested hierarchy of relationships between entities. So if you consider, for example, the wider context that we're all human beings, that is a wider context that some of us are entrepreneurs. And if you're going to look at what entrepreneurs do, you can avoid human evolution at the same time. Over a very long period of time, maybe what entrepreneurs do will change what we are as human beings. But you can forget about that and focus upon the entrepreneurial function, ignoring the evolution at the same time. So there's a hierarchy. Now, how do you organise the hierarchy? Well, um, that is complicated, but in fact, Marx gave us a way to do it. And what I'll be talking about next week, and so I'm actually finishing very quickly here, faster than I... I think we're going to go to a blank screen here. Let's see. No? OK. Um, but Marx had a philosophy which contradicts the labour theory of value, and I'll talk about why it does next week, uh, but it's compatible with a structured way of thinking about capitalism, which actually makes it possible to understand the various layers of complexity at one point by, uh, to another. Um, so, first of all, I'm going to, I'm going to finish up by here by talking about uh, the labour theory of value, because a large part of the labour theory of, of value is saying all wealth comes from labour, uh, if you put that in the terms of which I'm talking about that equation here, you get a result that uh, GDP per capita is about 1,000 calories a day, which is sheer nonsense. You've all consumed a lot more than 1,000 calories simply to get to this lecture, probably tens of thousands of calories. So that particular theory is wrong, but Marx does have a philosophy which I think is consistent with the laws of thermodynamics and lets us structure the complicated nature of capitalism as well. And this is an area which is quite contentious. Um, I get criticised for my views 
enormously. It doesn't worry me all that much. But what you've probably heard is dialectics. You've heard this expression, thesis, antithesis, synthesis. Not only is it almost impossible to pronounce, it's not Marx's dialectics. It belongs to another guy called Ficht. Uh, and if you want to do any reading on this before class next week, there's a book by a guy called Wild called Marx and Contradiction. And that's still the best reference I've seen on the actual nature of Marx's philosophy. But what I'll show next week is that you can actually get a version of Marx which is completely consistent with the organicism concepts that some post-Keynesians argue underlie Keynes's logic. The trouble is it never he never set it out in, explicitly. You've got to read all of Marx to get any idea of what his overall philosophical framework is. So what I'll try to give you next week is drag that out and then give you his philosophy almost in a diagrammatic format as a way of understanding capitalism. And so that's the, that's the reference I'd recommend looking at if anybody wants to dive in and, and read up in advance. Um, so I was repeating myself, but it was mainly in the Grand Teresa. So that's what I'm going to talk about next lecture, complete change of pace over to philosophy rather than uh, thermodynamics and, and so on. Right.